The enemy would love nothing more than to rob your hope, to steal your confidence, and destroy your humility to repent and step into what God has for you. What's up, what's up, incredible people? I love you so much. My name is Emma, and I am so, so happy that you have hopped on over to my YouTube channel. I pray that the Lord would use this to bless you, and I pray that you would grow in your relationship with Him through this video. We are talking today about temptation, and that can sometimes be a touchy top topic just because it brings about these memories of when we've given in to temptation, when we've gone against God's best to satisfy ourselves because we thought we knew what was best. And it can bring about a lot of shame and it's almost like hard to listen in on the truth and the encouragement and the, the power of God's word in conversations like these, in messages like these, because at the forefront of your mind, it's just shame. But yeah, okay, that's awesome for next time, but it's kind of hard to be encouraged to like go with the Lord next time I'm faced with temptation because like, what's the point if I've already messed up 10,000 plus times behind me? Or if I'm, there's one memory that I have of me messing up big time and it just plagues my mind. It's just plastered on the forefront of my memory. And I just want to encourage you that that is not from the Lord. That shame of you thinking that you can't walk into the truth. You can't step into the light. You can't look to the Lord and be radiant. You can't be a new creation. You can't like change your way. Like those, those lies of you can't, you can't, you can't, you are what you've done. You are where you've been. So therefore you can't move forward and see something new. That is not from the Lord. The enemy would love nothing more than to rob your hope, to steal your confidence and destroy your humility to repent and step into what God has for you. And so I wanna encourage you in two things. One, that you're not alone. I, even as I speak into this camera, I myself and everyone who could be watching this video along with you have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all have things that we wish we would have done differently. We all have times where we've gone against God's best for us. So that's the first thing. Be encouraged that you are not alone in your mess ups. But the second thing is that there's a difference between wallowing in shame and having a godly sorrow. Because when we have a godly sorrow, it leads us to repentance. Saying, God, I'm not proud of what I've done. I'm not proud of where I've been. It didn't honor you. It sits in my heart like this heavy, icky weight. And it, it's, I'm tired of it. And the beauty about repentance is that it's simply turning around. And the beauty of confession is it's simply voicing to the Lord, God, I have gone against your best and thought that my way was better. And so God, today, I am turning from that way of living. I am turning from that kind of decision making and I am looking to you. Aren't you so thankful that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all our unrighteousness. So instead of wallowing in shame right now, I challenge you right now in this moment, have some godly sorrow that then leads you to repentance. Don't sit in it, but let this be a motivation of, all right, let's go. Let's do this thing. No, I'm not going to do it perfectly moving forward, but through faith in Christ Jesus, I am a new creation. The old has passed away. The new is here. I, there is now no condemnation for me who is in Christ Jesus. I am sealed in his spirit. I am the head and not the tail as I look to the Lord. I, I am made new. I am a royal priesthood, a holy nation. I am I belong to the Lord. I am set apart to be holy as he is holy. And it's by the power of his spirit that I can live the life he's called me to live. I am his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared beforehand that I should walk in them. Get behind me, Satan. I don't have time to let shame plaster my memory anymore. Now I see that and I say, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. 
Now I see that and I say, praise God for his kindness toward me that led me to repentance. So be encouraged in those two things. One, you're not alone. And two, you aren't made to wallow in shame, but have godly sorrow that leads to repentance. Be encouraged and let's do this thing. We're talking about temptation today. And to be tempted, it literally means to be lured and enticed by our own desires. And we all have desires. Like, we have desires to be liked. We have desires to be successful. We have desires to be noticed. We have desires to be content. Desires to feel good. And a, a lot of that is not bad in and of itself. Like, it's not bad to want to feel good. It's not bad to want to be successful. It's not bad to want to be liked. Like those are just desires. But when it goes wrong is when we don't submit those desires to God. And we take the responsibility of fulfilling those desires in our own hands and try and fulfill them by our own means in the world's way. When we go against God to satisfy ourselves, we are sinning. And that sin leads to death. So to be tempted, I'm lured and enticed by my own desires. I want to be liked. I want to feel satisfied. I want to be noticed. I want to be successful. I want to be comfortable. I want to feel good. And instead of taking those desires that we have and putting it at the feet of Jesus and saying, I submit this to you and I trust that in you I lack no good thing. I trust that you see these desires and you see the root of them. You see them beyond surface level. And in you, you supply my every need. In you, you give me what I'm actually craving. You make me whole, God, in a way this world may promise but can never actually follow through with. And when we don't take those desires to God and trust Him as we sacrifice the immediate gratification, as we sacrifice what we think is best and trust Him, that's the best route ever. But when we don't do that and we depend on ourselves and the world to gratify us when we want it, how we want it, where we want it, with who we want it, then we are sinning as we disobey the Lord. And sin leads to death. It's just, that's just how it is. Our own desires entice us to find satisfaction in the most convenient, popular, instantly gratifying kind of way, but going down that route only leaves us lacking. And this makes sense that it would only leave us lacking because Satan is described in scripture as the father of lies, yet he masquerades himself as the light. And in James, we actually find that the, the Lord is the father of lights. So it's actually in the Lord that we lack no good thing. It's actually from him that we have every good and perfect gift. It's actually in him that we find light that never fades away and that actually satisfies us and give us direct, gives us direction and clarity. But the enemy who is the father of lies and pretends to be the light telling us that he's totally like cutting us short and we're missing out by following God's route because we're, we're not getting everything that we actually could be getting and it's actually in the world and it's in ourselves and it's in everything but God that we can find what we were made for. We can find who we are. We can find gratification. We can find comfortability. We can find success. We can find popularity by going against God's way because the enemy would love for us to think, yeah, God's holding out on you. He's the father of lies who pretends to be the father of lights. So it makes sense. And that's why I want to talk about temptation today. Because there is something so beautiful about being equipped so that not if, but when we are faced with temptation to go against God's best and think that the world's way, think that our own way and our flesh is better, when we have predecided the route that we're going, when we have predecided what we value, what matters to us, when we have predecided what we are going to refuse to and what we're going to refer to in these moments of temptation, well, when we get there, we're equipped. We're prepared to say no in the face of evil and say yes, even when almost everything in us wants to say yes to evil, even when everything in our flesh wants to go against God's best. We've predecided, knowing by the power of the Spirit, I'm taking the escape route because my God's always faithful to give me an escape route in that moment. 
And that's what I want to equip us with today by the word of God to refuse to step in to the enticing lure of temptation and refer to the things that we value. So we are going to be talking about a guy named Joseph and we're going to be in Genesis chapter 39. So I'm literally just going to read through the chapter because it's so good and we can learn a lot from it. So Genesis chapter 39 Verse 1, when Joseph was taken to Egypt by the Ishmaelite traders, he was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer. Potiphar was captain of the guard for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph. Okay, I just want to pause here for a hot second and take note that a lot has just gone down that was really heavy and really confusing and really hurtful. Joseph literally was thrown in a pit, sold into slavery to the Ishmaelite traders by his brothers, by blood, by family. Okay? And then he is sold to Potiphar and now is living in Egypt. Like, can you imagine how betrayed, how hurt, how confused he must be feeling? And in that, in what probably felt like the deepest, darkest, most confusing time, it says the Lord was with him. I don't know who needs to hear this, but to you who feels like you're in the deepest, darkest part of your life, there's no place you could go to flee from the presence of the Lord. Where can you go from his presence? Whether you rise on the wings of the dawn or settle on the far side of the sea, even there his hand will guide you. Even there his right hand will hold you fast. Praise God that in Christ Jesus we are not separated ever. We cannot ever be separated from the love of God. So just be encouraged that the darkness is as light to the Lord. And there's no place that you could go. There's no kind of day that you could have that God's like, okay, I, I'll be with you on this kind of day or when you're feeling this certain way. But if you're feeling that way or if you're in that kind of a season, then peace out. No, he says, never will I leave you. He says, never will I forsake you. So be encouraged, friend. The Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. He succeeded because God was with him. He succeeded because God caused favor to be on his life. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. Isn't that so cool? That God was moving in Joseph's life. God was with Joseph, and Potiphar took note of it. I love that so much. Whenever we're walking in step with the Lord and God is working in our lives and other people, whether or not they know it's the Lord that they see in our life, they're like, something different about you. I'm so encouraged by you. I think that's so beautiful. This pleased Potiphar. So he soon made Joseph his personal attendant. He put him in charge of his entire household and everything that he owned. From the day Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. All his household affairs ran smoothly and his crops and his livestock flourished. So because God was with Joseph and because God's hand was on him and he had favor on his life, when Joseph was put in charge of Potiphar's household, God then also blessed Potiphar and his household. So cool. So Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything that he owned. So with Joseph there, Potiphar didn't have to worry about anything except for what he would eat. Like Potiphar was able to just really chill because Joseph was working everything and the Lord, because he had his hand on him, Joseph was successful in everything. Now we continue to continue in verse six. Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man, verse 7. And Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. So she has this desire, and she's enticed by it. She's being lured by it. She's being tempted. And she acts on it. Come and sleep with me, she, she demanded. And this is what I really want to hone in on, verse 8. But Joseph refused. He refused. Look, he told her. 
my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He has held back nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. Now there are three things that I just notice whenever I read that, that Joseph refused immediately. Like, no, nada. And let me tell you why. These are the three things that I want us to take away today. When facing temptation, these are the three things that we need to already have the answer to. Joseph considered his position, he considered the position of others, and he considered God's position. Joseph considered himself, he considered others, and he considered God. He literally says, like, I have been given this position of authority. I have been entrusted to care for this household. Like he was being, he was reflecting on the fact that like I, I have been entrusted with this position of leadership. When in the face of temptation, I want you to reflect on who you are and what has been entrusted to you, what roles you have, what titles you hold, where like, what influence do you have? Reflect on yourself, reflect on your position, because whether or not you say no in the face of temptation, it will impact you and your position and your leadership and what influence you carry and how that influence ripples out. It will impact it. He reflected on his position. He reflected on other people's position. He reflected on Potiphar. He reflected on Potiphar's wife. He's like, are you kidding? He said, my master, he trusts me. My master, he has held back nothing from me. Again, he trusts me and he's held back nothing from me except you because you're his wife. And so I'm also considering the fact that you're his wife. I'm considering you. Why am I saying this? Because the decisions that you make don't only impact you, they impact others as well. Every time. Whether or not you say no in the face of temptation is going to directly impact yourself and it will impact other people. Every time. And then he considers God's position. As he said, how could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. He considered the Lord. He wanted to honor God. He wanted to honor himself and he wanted to honor others. He considered who he was. He considered where God had placed him. He considered what God had entrusted to him. He considered those around him. He knew that his decisions did not only impact him. And so these are the things I wanna encourage you in as you are not if, but when you are faced with temptation today <laughs> because it's just a reality. But praise God that we are, none of us are tempted beyond what's common to mankind. <laughs> and that when we are tempted, God is faithful and just to provide an escape route every time. So here's what I want to encourage you in, in the face of temptation. Number one, consider who you are. Consider where God has placed you. Consider what he's entrusted to you right now. Because whenever you decide what you value, whenever you decide the life you're going to live, how you're going to steward what has been entrusted to you, then when those times of temptation come, you're ready. You're ready to respond in obedience to God. You're ready to respond in faithfulness. You're ready to respond in courage because you predecided what you're about. Number two, consider those around you. Your decisions never only impact you. Consider those around you. And number three, consider the Lord. What pleases him, what honors him, and what is in alignment with his word. And you know what that requires? It requires that we know his word. I love in Psalm 119 where the psalmist says, how can I keep my way pure? It's it's by walking in the path of God's word, of what he has commanded, of what he says. 
I've, I have hidden your word in my heart, O oh God, that I may not sin against you. I keep his word close. I keep his word at the forefront of my mind. I am in his word meditating on it day and night so that whenever darkness pretending to be light comes my way, I can actually discern what is light and what is not because it is the word that is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And I can take the enticements. I can take the desires. I can take the opportunities that look really good and I can hold them up to the word of God. And if it does not align with God, God's word, I've pre-decided that I'm not about it. Consider yourself, consider others, and consider the Lord. Let's keep reading. Verse 10. So Potiphar's wife didn't stop here, okay? She kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day. And this is why I'm saying it's so important to be on guard, be alert, be of sober mind because your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking for whom he may devour. So stand firm, therefore, knowing that, as I said, you're not alone. Your family of believers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And after suffering for a little while, God himself will restore you. Stand firm because you have a real enemy. Your battle is not against flesh and blood, but it is against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So put on the full armor of God, not just one time, but every day. I'm going to have on the helmet of salvation. I'm going to put on the breastplate of righteousness. I am going to have the shield of faith, which extinguishes every flaming arrow. Not the one, but every single one of the flaming arrows of the evil one. I'm going to have the belt of truth buckled around my waist. I'm going to have the shoes that come from the gospel of peace buckled around my feet, and I will have the sword of the spirit that is the word of God. And you better believe that I am going to be devoted to prayer, praying in the spirit on all occasions. He kept, or she kept continually, day after day, putting pressure on Joseph. But this is what we read right after, he refused. He kept refusing because he knew what was most important, because he knew what mattered. He knew what he valued. He was holding tightly to what was good. He knew that God was worth it. He knew that following God's commands is not a burden, but out of love for God, I'm gonna obey God. He kept refusing. That's endurance, friends. That's long suffering, that's patience. I'm gonna to continue to trust in the Lord day in and day out by his strength. I can't do that on my own, but by his strength. And he kept out of her way as much as possible. This is so cool to me. So I am so, so grateful to have the honor of being an aunt. I have a, I have multiple nieces and nephews, but I have one nephew in particular who's one and a half, and he's in this phase that he likes to test you. He likes to test his boundaries. If he's doing something and he can see that he's getting a reaction out of you, he kind of pushes the limit a little bit. If you tell him no, he sees how many times he can do it until he understands you really mean no, <laughs> if you know what I'm saying. So the other day we were over at my sister-in-law's house and um, my nephew, he was like playing with this cabinet, opening and closing it. And my sister-in-law was like, she was like telling him, you need to stop, you need to stop, you need to stop. I will make you stop or you can choose to stop your choice, but you need to stop. And finally he stopped, but he was still standing there. And my sister-in-law said, hey, why don't we go find one of your toy trucks? That way you're not tempted. And it was such a simple moment, but she was redirecting his attention to go and play with some of his toys that was somewhere else in the house so that he wasn't standing by the very thing that he kept playing with, kept pushing the limits on, kept pushing boundaries on so that he wouldn't be tempted by it. And I just thought about that practical picture when I read about how Joseph kept out of her way as much as possible. 
We cannot expect ourselves to stand firm in the word of the Lord if we keep playing with sin, if we keep playing with temptation. Like I'm setting boundaries vocally, like with my boyfriend that we're not going to sleep together. But the way that we finish our dates, the way that we go and hang out in the car, the way like we okay, I may vocally be saying that we are keeping boundaries, but I'm not keeping out of the way of the temptation. I need to not say, only say that I have boundaries, but I need to actually put boundaries in place and keep out of temptation's way. That doesn't mean temptation is still going to come, but that means I'm setting myself up for success here. That means I'm taking God's word seriously and I am fleeing from it. I am I, I just thought that was so encouraging and like, wow, that's so wise. He, kept, he not only refused, but he kept out of her way. He didn't keep going into her bedroom or making sure he saw her every day. It was like, no, I am keeping away from you as much as possible because I do not want what you were enticing me to do. That was so good. But then verse 11, I'll just finish reading this because there's some really sweet encouragement here. One day, however, no one else was around when he went to do his work. He was going about his own business. But she came and grabbed him by his cloak, demanding, Come on, sleep with me. Joseph tore himself away, but he left his cloak in her hand as he ran from the house. He's running in, keeping out of its way, refusing because I'm considering myself, I'm considering you and your husband, and I am considering my God. When she saw that she was holding his cloak and he had fled, she called out to her servants. Soon all the men came running. Look, she said, my husband has brought this Hebrew slave here to make us make fools of us. He came, in to, he came into my room to rape me, but I screamed. So she's lying about it. When he's heard me scream, he ran outside and got away, but he left his cloak behind with me. She kept the cloak with her until her husband came home. Then she told him her story. That Hebrew slave you brought into our house tried to come in and fool around with me, she said. But when I screamed, he ran outside, leaving his cloak with me. Verse 19, Potiphar was furious when he heard his wife's story about how Joseph had treated her. So he took Joseph and threw him into prison, where the king's prisoners were held, and there he remained. But the Lord was with Joseph in the prison and showed him his faithful love. The Lord was still with Joseph, even in the prison even in the false accusations, even in the lies, his faithful love was with Joseph. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. Before long, the warden put Joseph in charge. Why? Because the Lord was with him. Of all the other prisoners and over everything that happened in the prison, the warden had no more worries, just as Potiphar. Because Joseph took care of everything, the Lord was with Joseph and caused everything he did to succeed. And that... That is something that I really want to bring so much encouragement to is that even in the difficulty and even in the false accusations, the Lord was still with Joseph and he was still showing him unfailing love. And by you refusing to go with the grain of the world and by you deciding to say no in the face of temptation and believe that God's way is best, even whenever it doesn't feel that way, especially when you're in the heat of temptation, the Lord honors that. And there will be people who will falsely accuse you. There will be people who will make it difficult for you. There will be people who misunderstand you. But I want to encourage you that even in the midst of that, the Lord is with you. His unfailing love will guide you. Be encouraged. Because I don't know about you, but I, I want to abide in the Lord and I want to be led by his unfailing love more than I want to have a moment of satisfaction or a moment of approval from people because I did what everyone else was doing. The Lord is with you and you're going to be okay. The Lord is with you and you're going to be okay. I want to encourage y'all in this Every time I've waited on the Lord, trusted in him and followed his guidance, my desires have met at a level, have been met at a level and in a way that the enemy could have never even attempted to give. 
Isn't it interesting how our deepest desires are met when we do the very thing that feels like we're resisting our desires? In the face of temptation, I say no to what looks like would feel really good and it feels like I'm saying no to what would be best. But by saying yes to God's best, my desires are satisfied in a deeper way than what I could have ever made happen on my own. Yes, we may be saying to no to the current thing, but in doing so, we are saying yes to the eternal thing. We may be saying no to the temporary pleasure, but we are saying yes to the eternal pleasure of walking with God. Consider yourself today. Consider those around you today. And consider God today in the face of temptation. God's way is best. God's way is best. I love y'all so much. So much. Y'all have an amazing day. Bye, y'all.